Hey it's Clayton, welcome to howtodrawcomics.net. In the first video to this expanded three-part series, I'll show you from start to finish how my comic book illustration of Harley Quinn was constructed, designed, and refined. In this first part, we'll focus on the foundations, including character posing and construction, defining shape, creating backgrounds, and how to bring all of that together in order to clearly convey the story that you want to tell to your audience. I hope you enjoy the video. I begin all of my drawings rather blandly. No fun, fancy details, design, or even anatomy. Before I get caught up in all those intricacies, I'm looking more toward the technical aspects to set up the foundations that everything else will be built on top of. By technical aspects, I'm talking about composition, perspective, pose, and proportion. These are the most important elements to establish in the beginning of every drawing because they define the broader framework that holds up the rest of the illustration. If that framework is flawed, that means everything else that gets lathered in on top later down the track will be flawed along with it. The funny thing is, whatever is established within the first half an hour or so into a drawing often determines its ultimate success. I've already got a fairly vivid idea as to what I want the finished artwork to look like. Going into it, I know roughly how I want to pose Harley, how she'll be positioned on the canvas, and how much space she'll take up. In my mind, I'm viewing her slightly above eye level, so I'm also taking into account the perspective, although at this point I haven't drawn up any perspective grid guides to work by. The reason for that is because I don't want her pose to necessarily be confined to the technical parameters of perspective just yet. What's more important to me before that is to correctly convey her attitude and personality to the viewer using her pose as a conduit to do so. Now here's how I'm doing that. Again, I don't want to get caught up in the details here, that's just going to stiffen up the entire drawing. What we want here is to create a certain rhythm of movement within the drawing. What do I mean by that? Well, basically, rather than having Harley in a state of rigor mortis, I really want a pose that comes across as natural, as organic. So I'm going to initially sketch her in using a very primitive mannequin model whose forms will be strung together in a particular trajectory of movement. On the screen, you can see how her body has a relaxed C shape to it that curves around from her head all the way down to the bottom of the pelvis. Add in the legs and that C turns into an S. Her arms too have their own course to follow. It doesn't look like much and it's far from fancy, but once the building blocks for my drawing is laid down with these rather roughly drawn primitive forms, most of the brain straining thinking is essentially over and done with. Don't get me wrong, it won't be completely smooth sailing, but from here on out, everything else will follow along in accordance with that initial rough sketch. Think of it as being part of the drawing's evolutionary timeline. It starts out primitive, and a little rough around the edges, but over time, it refines itself into its ultimate form. I've taken down the opacity of the draft layer and created a new layer above it to begin tightening up Harley's silhouette. The mannequin model's purpose is to really capture the character's gesture, but the next important layer that needs to be built up from that is the shape of the form. Typically, that's how our brains work when recognising the world around us visually. Using your peripherals right now, you might even notice that the objects off to the side of your focus are defined first by broad shapes. Once our eyes catch those silhouettes, they'll naturally explore the details encapsulated within them. That makes shape incredibly important when drawing, because the more clearly it's defined, the easier it'll be for the viewer to take in and read our drawing overall. To help me correctly capture these shapes in an appealing but accurate way, I keep Harley's anchor points of anatomy in mind here, such as the position of her collarbones, her breasts, hips, and the protrusions created by the bicep and tricep muscles on her arms. It's almost like working with clay. You have to sculpt out the general shape first in order to work in the more complex forms. This also applies to hair. Despite all the individual strands that fold together into a particular cut or style, I define the broader volumes here first, giving me enough information to note the direction I want to take it in when I begin refining the drawing. As I define the hips here, it takes some reworking to get the silhouette looking right. Her anatomy is important and does play a role in this process. But although I like to keep it in mind, what really helps me to judge whether or not something is looking correct is its shape. 
These are still very early stages too, so it's quite easy to erase and retweak the forms where needed until I'm happy with the way those areas are chiseled out. In fact, it's better to address these broader portions of the drawing sooner rather than later because although the lines are nowhere near as rough or loose as the draft, this is still the foundational structure that'll be used as a pillar to hold up everything else. The stronger we can make that pillar, the more of a chance the drawing will have its success. One of the biggest players in comic art is body language, which of course is conveyed through a character's pose. I would go so far as to say that it's just as important as learning the technical aspects of drawing such as anatomy, perspective and composition. Because it is what gives life to a character, it communicates their personality. Because comic art is a visual medium though, it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking only of the physical visual aspects of a character such as their design. That is, however, only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to drawing comic book characters. What does the pose I've given Harley here say about her? Well, for me, Harley has always come across as a character who is rather cheeky, sexy, playful, yet dangerously homicidal. So emotionally disconnected from the havoc she causes that she's almost naive to it. And she is in a way. Her love for the Joker has her motives so clouded that she'll do just about anything he asks of her, unquestioned. He knows it too, being very aware of the manipulative power he has over her. Now I somehow need to show all of that to the viewer without saying a single word. But what does playful look like? What does dangerous look like? Certain visual cues clue us into those suggestions, such as her curved flirtatious stance and the firm grip she has on that bucket-sized hammer of hers. Think about the poses that come to mind for you. Your experience of dangerously flirtatious, confidently cool, or insecure weakness might be similar but different to mine. So try to be observant. It's those subtleties that make our artwork individual and unique beyond just the lines and details on the page. In saying all of that, picking an appropriate pose for Harley Quinn was somewhat straightforward since her character is already fairly well established in the world of comics. Keeping that in mind, I tried to feel out, almost embody her character as I was drawing, to keep my interpretation of her congruent with who she was. Sounds strange, I know, but it's almost like method acting. Sometimes you really want to get into the head of your character in order to convey them as vividly as possible to the audience. Try to push and exaggerate the body language of your characters too, especially when drawing for comics. That's what they're all about after all, taking the viewer and throwing them into an often over-the-top dramatic universe that becomes imprinted in their memories time and time again. Levels of realism may sometimes hold you back from doing this, and it really depends on how you personally view the world of comics. But think about why companies such as Pixar, DreamWorks, or even Disney are so popular with their audience. It's because they push the emotional and physical stereotypes of their characters in the way they look, move and act to the extreme, making them unmistakably relatable to the audience. People like things they can relate to and understand, otherwise they become confused or simply uninterested in the subject matter. Now I've taken Harley to a point where I'm happy with her foundations and moved on to the background. As you probably already saw, it took me a few iterations to actually decide on this particular backdrop because that initial idea I had floating around in my head at the beginning didn't actually have one to go with it. Ultimately, I figured Arkham Asylum would be the perfect environment to ground Miss Quinn into and settled on that. The guard in the background who's had an unfortunate pummeling match with Harley's hammer is proving to be somewhat of a challenge to present correctly here. You can see me raising this guy over and over again to try and find a reasonable fix to the issues I'm having with him. Since I'm only using the trusty old mannequin model here as a posed prototyper, that's fine. I can keep it rough, I can keep it loose and redraw as much as I need to. Sometimes it's just a matter of getting all the messed up, disjointed and double jointed disproportionate drafts out the way first before hitting the jackpot. That's just part of the process when it comes to difficult positions from unfamiliar perspectives, even for a seasoned pro. I really wanted to include these reworkings in the video instead of cutting them out for that reason. Because we all face our own challenges when it comes to drawing that we must struggle with and overcome. That's what keeps us engaged enough to keep drawing in the first place. The times when I've been motivated to draw the most were when I was driven to get better, to conquer my shortcomings and to get to that next level in my abilities. 
The moment you don't feel that, the moment you feel you're good enough, that momentum just seems to slow right down. For some reason, drawing becomes stagnant. It loses its substance. Backgrounds often tend to get left on the back burner, and hey, I'm no exception. Like I said, I really had no idea what I was going to drop in there behind Harley. But I'll tell you one thing, they're incredibly underrated. You would not believe the depth and substance a background can add into your artwork. Not only do they ground your characters into a world of their very own, they literally suck the viewer into that world too. Instead of looking at this character floating around in an endless white void, we go to escape our own reality and immerse ourselves in theirs. Here's the other well worthwhile reason you want to drop a backdrop into your illustrations. They help to tell a story. In this piece, for example, it's very clear that a sequence of events have unfolded, which, without that background, would not be comprehensible to the audience. We've got Harley stirring up trouble in Arkham, and this poor security guard was whacked in the process, and going by the smashed tiles and cracked concrete on the wall behind him, it was pretty darn hard. Finally, backgrounds just make the entire drawing a lot more interesting to look at. We've got Harley as the main subject, the security guard as a secondary point of focus, and then there's this background which, once detailed, will be there for the viewer to explore top to bottom as they're drawn further into the artwork. Adding props into the mix can also help to convey the story you're trying to tell your viewers and contribute to the illustration's overall composition. They also help to add interest to the drawing by filling it out with something more for the viewer's eyes to latch onto. This brings me to why understanding what you're drawing in terms of form rather than subject is so important. Of course, you could go about filling up your sketchbooks with guns and hammers, or for that matter, carefully studying and drawing every possible thing there is to draw out there in the entire world. It'd take a rather lengthy amount of time, but a billion or so sketchbooks later, you'd eventually get there. Or alternatively, you can understand that almost every conceivable solid object in existence can be broken down into three very simple, highly manipulatable, geometrical forms. The sphere, the cube, and the cylinder. And each can be stretched, scaled, and combined together to create the most complex creations imaginable. Here I'm lightly wrapping a guideline around each segment of Harley's body to help define its foreshortening and perspective in space. This not only indicates surface dimension, but it'll also come in useful later on for figuring out how the rendering should curve around the form to correctly describe it. I'm now going to define Harley's facial features using the head's proportional guidelines to help me place them. The face of a character is probably one of their most important aspects, at least for me. To start off with, you can bet the viewer's eye will be drawn straight to any faces within an illustration right off the bat because, before anything else, the audience attempts to perceive your characters first by understanding and relating to them. This is just out of habit. Think about it. Your face is how you communicate socially in your everyday life. You use a frown to show disapproval, a smile to show pleasure or amusement, a smirk to communicate conceit or smugness. Everything from the face's most minute micro-muscle movements to the direction of the eyes enables us to relate feeling and emotion from both the most subtle to dramatic levels. And whether you realize it or not, you too look for the same cues in any face you yourself are in front of. For me, this brings about a certain sense of anxiety when it comes to drawing these emotive mechanisms. I already know that Harley's face will be the first area of the illustration that people see, despite whatever else I might throw in there, thus it will be their first impression. So I not only tend to tackle it first in each of the foundation, defining and refining stages, but I also pay the most attention to getting its appearance to look right. Once I'm satisfied with it, it's kind of like a weight lifted from my shoulders. I'm now blocking in the design of Harley's costume, and at this point you might be wondering how I'm pulling out and laying down all these visual design elements from my head. Well, the truth is I'm not. My brain can only hold so much, which is why I take a much more conservative approach to drawing in the first place. Just as with the background and the guard, I'm using a handful of reference images to work from for her outfit. And when it comes to using reference material, there are a few different schools of thought. For example, some people might feel like they're cheating if they take advantage of it. 
Hey, from time to time, it is good to challenge yourself, relying on only the visual slideshow of reference images in your mind. But never using reference material is probably going to do you more harm than good in the long run. The reality is, your brain isn't big enough to store every minute piece of visual information of every subject you'll ever draw. In fact, it can barely hold the human anatomy in its entirety. It can store landmark information and your own symbolic interpretations of the subject matter you've recalled, but beyond that, it's near impossible to draw an exact replica of something from memory. Coming back around to address that awful face job from before, I'm going to opt for something a little more loose and less rigid than before. I often find if I'm too careful, especially in the beta phase of a drawing, I mess up a little more. It's kind of like being on a tightrope with someone down below yelling, Don't fall! Don't fall off now! Then all you can think about is falling off. Sometimes it pays to relax and tone down the mental stress a little bit. Next we'll be polishing up the pencils for this draft and cleaning those contours up into some silky smooth lines. Hey, I hope you enjoyed the video. In the second part, we'll take this foundational sketch of Harley into the refining stage as we solidify the drawing and streamline those pencils with some slick line weights. If you liked the video, share it with your friends and be sure to subscribe to this channel for more comic art tutorials. If you'd like updates on new videos, articles, tips and tricks, you can also sign up to the howtodrawcomics.net newsletter. Until next time, see you later.